Hello everyone. Again, welcome to the NLP for Sales follow-up training. Uh, we're going to just go over a few things, a lot of review because it's been a while. Uh, and it's always the things that you don't think about that end up, you know, getting you the most. And so we're just going to have some fun with this and see where it takes us. All right. So, first of all, let's a quick review NLP for Sales, why it's not used. Well, one of the big ones is there's the assumption that people tried it or they read a book one time years ago. They may know some of the words from the NLP uh, world or the hypnosis world. Or they heard of Tony Robbins. I'm a big Tony Robbins fan, but if you just go to his seminars and you don't understand the science behind it, it gets a little bit that. And a lot of people are just too arrogant to think that they need any other uh, techniques to add to their repertoire. You know, and one of my favorite sayings is, uh, contempt prior to investigation will leave one in eternal ignorance. And usually, you know, a lot of what people think about the NLP for sales is wrong. Because even if they've had it, had some kind of training, do you practice it? So my people reviewing, you know, have you practiced what we talked about, you know? And then, you know, are you doing the training? Because there's a lot of incompetent trainers out there. Now, those of you that are reviewing this from the NLP training that I did, NLP for sales, you know, there's, uh, you've got some good information if you're using it. You know, but the first rule of any business training is it has to be fun, it has to be fast, and you have to dazzle them at the end, and it has to be something that they can use every day. Now, the training we did um, in December, which was very focused, very fast, but we also went over a lot of information, and it was very user-friendly, because why do people use NLP? You know, here's one of the bases. First of all, it's, the, it's based in your neurology because your experiences, both conscious and unconscious, come through your senses and your central nervous system, including when you're trying to get in rapport with people, make sales, do anything like that. The linguistics, because language is the process that we use to process all of the meaning of our lives, right? And it's transformed through our language. And the programming, because people who reenact as a system or a program, now, one of the good things about this is it frees you up to do whatever you want to do. The bad thing is, uh, if you got stuck in old programs, it, it leaves you stuck. Now, again, I like to really review the five-step sales process that we talk about, right? And um, there we go, right? The five-step sales process, all right? First of all, you have to establish rapport. Rapport is everything. I stress that in the live trading. I'll stress it again. If you have rapport with somebody, you can build on that. Because if you have rapport, and again, rapport stands for really all people prefer others resembling them. So if we have good rapport, then you can ask questions. And by asking the right questions, you can find the true need that the person has. You know, not what they say they need, but what do they really need. And sometimes what people want and what people need are two different things, right? And so you have to be aware of that. And then you have to be able to link the need or the value to your product or service, right? And I always say link it to you first and then to the product or service. And then you just have to close. Now, if you do the first four steps, closing is as simple as saying, would you like to do it, right? I don't believe um, in any kind of, excuse me, fancy close process where you kind of, because to me that gets into where you're like tricking people into buy. And again, if you have the rapport, you've asked the right questions, you've established the right need, and you can actually fulfill it, then it's an easy process. But with this, there are basically five principles for success, right? The first is you have to know your outcome. This is one of the big problems we get into in any kind of sales, motivation, uh, uh, prospecting situation, is what is your outcome when, you, when you're starting? Do you have the outcome clear in your mind? Is this just to gather information? Is this a prospecting thing? Is this a, a, a sales call? I mean, where you already have the information, now you're doing the sales. What is the outcome for what you're doing? Then you have to take action, right? You have to, many people know what their outcome is, but they don't take action. I always say, a lot of people know their outcome is to get in shape, right? They don't, you want six pack abs, there's certain actions you have to take in different levels, right? So if you know your outcome, then you're able to take action. And then you have to have, sensory acuity. And what that means is, are you picking up on the data that the person is giving you for, for are they um, uh, 
uh, are they following along or not? Do you have sensory acuity? Can you tell what's going on, right? Uh, if you have good sensory acuity, you know if your action's working. If it's not working, you have to take different action. And that goes into be having behavioral flexibility, you know, because many times we're going to do A, B, C, and D. And what, if you're not flexible, what if you're at step A, but they're ready to sign the contract if you're in the sales situation, right? So, you know, if you're flexible or you get through A, B, C, and now you're ready at D, but now you they got to go back to A, right? Sometimes this happens. You have to be very flexible, right? And then lastly, you need to operate from a physiology of excellence, right? A physiology of, of physical state and a mental state of excellence. Because when you're in a good state, of course, it pulls people with you into a good state. And then it's easier to take them down that road. And for this to really work, I believe there are basically six empowering beliefs for a sales champion, right? Every prospect has their own model of the world. And a good salesperson, a good motivator, a good manager, understand each prospect, each target. I, I usually use the word target. Their model of the world, right? What's important to them? You know, as we're, as we're recording this today, <clears throat> we're in the, excuse me, we're in the middle of a... Uh, election cycle that we're seeing a lot of interesting stuff but what's interesting is because it's the primary season uh, they're only focused on you know their model of the world and their group's model of the world and so of course if you have a different model of the world and you're watching one side or the other all you'll do is make fun of it can you respect their model of the world it doesn't mean you have to agree with it but if you don't understand it or respect it you can't really influence them, right? It basically what then what happens is what's happening now in our political discourse where there's no communication, there's only clashes, right? So you have to respect it. And with respect, you can begin to understand it. Again, it doesn't mean you agree with it. You know, if you're trying to sell somebody a car, I need to know what your model of the world is, what's important to you in a car. You know, if you're the type to buy a Ferrari, that's much different than the person that's going to buy a, uh, a, 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 what do you call it, a cheaper, more practical model, right? You know, I, I was at a, a big seminar, and, and they were talking, the, the you know, Tony Robbins seminar, and, and we talked a little bit about how you, you know, how different people model of the world works, and so he asked, did anybody buy a new high-end car? And it was actually a guy sitting next to me, bought a Ferrari a couple months before this. So he's saying what's important to him in a car. Right. Of course, he said, first you go to the big base things, transportation and and all that. But you wouldn't buy a. It was a three hundred something thousand dollar Ferrari unless you want certain things, right? And that was his model of the world. It was about the respect that he got when he drove that car. It was about the feeling of power because that car had whatever he went through. He gave his model of the world. Great. Now, if I know that, I can use that. I can assume that's important to him in a lot of the things that he does. Great. Then they found somebody that had just bought a like Mazda 3, a very, very practical, you know, car. I think it's like sixteen or seventeen thousand dollars. And when they asked him, it was like, well, it was it has to be practical and had a good warranty, right? Because it was just a car. Now, again, that's his model of the world. Neither model is better than the other model, right? They're both great models for that person. But you can't sell that guy wanting to buy a Ferrari on that it's just a car and it's, you know, uh, obviously not practical, right? For him, for him, right? But for the other guy, you'd never sell him a Ferrari and because it was, it was not his model of the world. It was interesting. The guy that just bought the real uh, low-end car could have easily afforded the Ferrari, by the way. We found out later. It's just it didn't fit his model of the world. And again, once you learn this, you're like, hmm, right? So you could you could use this information in a lot of ways. And again, this is what happens is the meaning of the communication is the response that you get. So if what you're communicating with the person, if you're not getting the response back, you need to do something different. It goes back to our flexibility, right? And again, this goes back to a basic NLP presupposition, which is there's no failure, only feedback, right? We want to be really in, to, in tune with the client and realize if they're not going down that path, we need to do something different. And again, resistance in a client is a lack of rapport. 
If you have really good rapport, they'll give you more information. I usually say there's no resistant clients or, or prospects or anything. It's inflexible communicators. Always realizing you're not going to close every deal. You're not going to close every sale, right? That's fine. But what the other thing happens if you're doing this, if, you're, if you know the answer is going to be no, it's better to know that in an hour rather than a year, right? So the inner game of sales is all about the art of getting other people to do what you want and have them think it was their idea. And a quick review for our non-practitioner uh, types out there. Uh, the conscious mind, this is where most people spend, think they spend most of their time. This is the thing, right? But it's a small percentage of our mind. They usually say 10%. We don't know what it is. But consciously, you can only do a few things. It's analytical. It's rational. It's where your logic is set. It's your short-term memory. And it's willpower. Right? Well, it's interesting. You can really only do one of those things at a time. If you're analyzing data or you're using logic or you're trying to remember something at the moment, it's your conscious awareness, right? And it's also your conscious is how long you can focus on a task. Now, how long can you focus on a task with no external stimulation? For most people, it's only a few minutes, right? Yes, you can watch a movie for hours or read a book, but that's external stimulation. Just sit there and focus on a task, right? Just think about something. In the middle of it, you'll get a random thought. That's your subconscious mind, right? When you're thinking about this, oh, this deal you're working on and you're really lost in thought, suddenly you'll go, hmm, what's for dinner, right? Or, oh, I need to stop at the store on the way home. It's a random thought kind of drifts in your mind. It's your subconscious mind, right? Which is the great majority of your mind, 80, 90%. Because this is where your habits and beliefs are. It's where your long-term memory is. And for sales... It can't be stressed enough. This is where your values and emotions are, right? Because this is what you want to deal with. Because I'll say it again at the end, all sales are personal. And if you can get an emotional connection and tag into some values, you're much more likely to sign that person up, get the person to do the things that you want them to do, if you understand that. But to do that, you have to bypass that critical factor of the mind, the, the level between the conscious and the subconscious, where you can even talk to them. And again, to use our political discourse right now, how many times you've been, I'm not even going to talk about that. That's off the table. Well, if that's the statement, you can't even, it's, you're not even going to listen to this. You're, going to, uh, you're not going to take in data. You're going to remain ignorant because you're not taking in new information, right? But for those of us in sales, we have to be, sometimes have to bypass the critical factors of the mind to get people to take action, whatever that happens to be. Right, And then we want to review rapport, because rapport is, again, really all people prefer others resembling them. We like people who are like us, right? And what happens with rapport, you need to have your sensory acuity open, because even before you step into rapport, you need to be able to tell somebody's skin color, their breathing pattern, notice their eyes, do those kinds of things. Because when you're looking at someone, just glancing, Right? And this is a still photograph. But when you look at these two pictures, just by the eyes and the and the and the uh, mouth and, and, and the mouth, how the mouth, mouth the thing, would you say, would you guess she's experiencing two different things? And this was taken obviously on the same night, she's wearing the same dress, right? Well, one looks more that's interesting. This is a you know, this one's more of a yes, and this one's more of a what? Yeah, or something like that. So, uh, you know, but you can just see it, right? And again, the evidence is there if you look for it, right? And when you compare these two, you can see that in the eyes, how the eyes are set, and in the mouth, right? And if we really got into it, and, and, and of course it's a picture, so it's hard to tell, it looks like a little bit, because some of it could be lighting, it's a little bit in how the skin is, right? And things like that, right? So, rapport. The first level is physical rapport, right? The postures, gestures, the proximity, the thing, the facial expression, and then, you know, the mirroring and matching, we call that, right? If someone's sitting a certain way and you 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 sit the same way, what happens, it's called mirror neurons to review it. And those mirror neurons, <clears throat> excuse me, is when two people are in communication and there's an absence of conflict when one makes a motion 
right? Obviously, certain neurons have to fire in my head for me to do this. Well, if you were in close proximity, those same neurons fire in your head, right? Because it's how you're making sense of the world. It's called it's a threat analysis. It's how you're it's how you're seeing is this person in front of you a friend or a foe? Now it begins to happen if I'm going like this and we're talking and then you go like this. Well, suddenly you presented a mirror image of my neurology, and it draws us in even closer, right? Same with facial expressions, right? Things like eye the eyebrow flash is the number one. You know when you see somebody if you have an eyebrow flash and a smile, you're great. It, it, it opens you up, right? And then the breathing pattern. And these are easy to control, especially in live situations where you're one-on-one -on -one with a person, right? Now, sometimes, what if you're on the phone? What if you're using a Skype? Well, you can still listen to the voice, right? <clears throat> the tempo, the tone. Uh, I got a little something going on in my voice today. But even with that, you can still hear it in the, in the how fast I'm speaking, my tone, my tempo, the volume that I'm using. And then what, what words am I using? Am I visual, auditory, or kinesthetic? Am I talking about what I see, hear, or feel, right? And then are there any keywords that are important to me, right? If you talk to me uh, and you want to light me up, you want to talk about like subconscious, um, um, uh, motivation, uh, uh, fun, you know, challenging, those things light me up. Those are my keywords, all right? And so once you do that, you can do that on the phone just as easy, right? Because you can pick up the breathing because you can hear it if you try. If nothing else, you can tell by the, uh, the, the tempo of the speech because you have to breathe while you're talking. So you want to, this is the basis of rapport, right? And to establish rapport, remember, we like people who are like each other, right? And remember, people tend to communicate uh, at different levels. And they used to say that only a small percentage, like 7% is words, and most of it was physiology and some tonality. Well, we know now that's, that's the guy that came up with the study said it was totally misinterpreted. It wasn't what he meant. If anything, the last thing I read, he said it's more this way. 50% of the words you use, 20% is the tonality, with only 30% or less being physiology. Right. But when these all line up, that's what we would call in NLP and hypnosis congruent, you know, again, uh, because it's so prevalent right now. When you're watching a really confident politician, right, or speaker, they, they're using good words. Their tone matches the words that they're using. You don't say, I'm angry. This really makes me livid. Right. It doesn't come across. Right. And, and I forget which one of the candidates. Uh, was saying about that. this really makes me mad. It shouldn't be allowed, right? And his physiology was very relaxed, as opposed to you know one of the candidates talks about how things make him mad and he wants to do this and that. Well, it's a it's a complete package, right? And if you look at the people that are in rapport with each one of those candidates on either side, the the words match whatever is important to them. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> like on the Democratic side, you got like. You know, Bernie Sanders talking about, you know, fair and equitable and, and spreading the wealth and spreading the risk and doing those things. You know, and if those are my words, if those are my keywords, it's going to light me up, right? And his tonality is very calm, very grandfatherly, and it matches his physiology, right? And that's another reason I think whether on the Democratic side when you watch it, um, uh, Hillary Clinton isn't connecting with people because she seems much more polished. You know, and she, she was giving a speech about how things really upset her and that this should not be allowed and da, da, da. But there was no passion, right? And then, of course, on the Republican side, you know, you, they're a little bit more passionate about what they believe. It doesn't matter what your thing is. When you watch it, don't do these things line up. But, you know, do the, if the words and everything match, especially if they're your keywords, you're going to get in rapport with them because you want to mirror match the breathing, right, the voice the tone, the tempo, the timbre, the volume, right? And if you could do the physiology, like stand like they stand, move like they move, and all this, it really speeds up rapport, right? And again, <clears throat> then you want to listen for the rep systems that they're using, right? And this is something I constantly have to remind myself because I fall into what I am, which is kinesthetic visual or visual kinesthetic, depending on where I am, you know? 
And I use a lot of words like look, see, hear, or look, see, appear. Is that clear? Is this focused? Is it bright? Is it colorful? I don't use a lot of auditory words. Does this sound good to you? Is this clear? Is this, you know, does this harmonize? Things like that. And I seem to use a lot of <clears throat> kinesthetic words, touch, feel, grasp, get a hold of. You know, depending on what I'm doing, I'm either visual, kinesthetic, or kinesthetic visual. You know, I like to just roll, as you can see, I like to roll my sleeves up and just jump in and do it, you know. And unless I'm actually presenting in a business setting, I'm, I'm much more casual and laid back. It's very kinesthetic. This is a comfortable shirt. I'm comfortable. I'm in my chair. There's the horse stuff behind me. You know, I'm very, it's very kinesthetic, right? And, of course, you could use unspecified words. Um, but once you have rapport, then you can ask the proper questions, right? And in sales, this is everything. But first, I wanted to review that because if you're not getting rapport, you're not going to ask the questions. If you've got rapport and you ask the questions, they're much more likely to tell you what's really going on inside their heads. You know, for what purpose are you looking for an X? Use my car analogy. What purpose are you looking for in, a, in, a, in this kind of car? You know, what specifically do you want in it? He wanted a car that was high performance, that had high status. That's what was important to him. You know, what will you see, hear, or feel when you have it? Well, he felt better. He felt more confident. He knew that uh, uh, to him it was important. It made him feel good, right? Um, and how will you know when you have the right X? Because he was looking at other high-performance sports cars, right? <clears throat> Thank you. My wife's giving me something to drink. It's kind of good. I think Todd's on the call. Over here, we got red tie. So it's really messing with it your sinus. So, you know, how will you know when you have the right one, right? And he said it would just feel right. And he would get good feedback from other people. This was important. It would feel right and he would get good feedback, you know? And what would that allow you to do, right? Well, it would give him that sense of, uh, of accomplishment. He'd made a lot of money and he'd been very frugal most of his life. And he's like, you know, it's time that uh, I spend my, it means I'm worth it. I'm worth this multi-million dollars I'm making. You know, I can drive this car and then it's just a car, right? And so again, now if you went back to the other guy, what purpose are you looking for in this car? Well, transportation. What do you want in it? Reliability, low cost, you know? Well, you see, feel here when you have it. Well, you, you know, and this guy kind of said, well, he looked at all the data. Again, he was much more analytical, right? And what will having this kind of car allow you to do? He could spend my money on other things. I don't even know what it was. He could have bought a Ferrari or the high-end Mercedes or whatever, but he did what he did, right? Because this really gets to the question, what's important to you about this, right? If status and high performance were important to you, you'd never buy that other car. But if, if uh, 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 um, being frugal, being, you know, very uh, on task with your money, right, is important to you, you won't, you probably won't go buy a Ferrari, right? Again, they're both cars, right? They both are useful. Uh, it's what's important to you about it, right? If I know that, I can sell you other things, right? And the purpose of asking a question is to establish the need. Now, once you have that need, you're able to fulfill it. Because 80% of the people have already bought the item in their mind before they even talk to any salesperson in any situation, right? They haven't decided which one yet, but they're, they've already bought it. Maybe they just haven't decided which one yet. Like my friend, the guy, I actually knew him, that bought the Ferrari. He knew he was buying something. He already had a Tesla. But was he going to buy a Ferrari? Was he going to buy, the, what else was he looking at? The uh, Mercedes a, uh, AMG, that Audi, that real expensive Audi. He was looking at all these cars. He'd already bought one of them in his mind. He hadn't decided which one, right? So once we knew, you know, once you know that, then you can begin to do it. And, you know, and the Ferrari dealer did something that the others didn't do. They talked about how very few people really drive Ferraris. And what he meant by really drive them is drive them, right? Do you do you just, you know, you get these people, they got a 10-year-old Ferrari. It's only got 10,000 miles on it because they never drive it. And 
my friend had also made this statement that he wanted to be able to drive the car, right? What He didn't want to be one of these guys that bought something and put it in the garage, never drove it. So it was interesting. So, you know, he'd already bought it, and this guy fulfilled that need, right? And, and again, once you're really going to do this, you need to uh, establish a pain point for, for the opportunity. And you can, you can increase or establish more value by increasing the pain that that person's feeling, right? And to use the analogy of the uh, a guy buying Ferrari, um, you know, you could say the longer you delay getting it, the longer you're away from that status that you want, right? Because the greater the pain, the easier the sale, right? And if you make the pain increase, there's, that adds up more pain for inaction, right? Basically, people minimize problems for, that's a high-end sales, but like, you know, to use, um, when I had my clinic, I use it, I'll use a hypnosis salesman. When I had my clinic, you know, people minimize the problem when they come in and talk to you. I'm not that fat. I only smoke a half a pack a day. Yeah, whatever it is, they'll minimize it because it's what, it's what we do, right? Uh, you know, I really don't drink that much, they'd say, right? So I'd have to maximize the pain, right? Because, you know, basically it's like rubbing salt in the wound. You got to bring the pain back up if you want them to take action right now. You know, what's bringing them into your store? What's bringing them into your clinic? What's bringing them into whatever contact with you, depending on what you're selling? I just worked with somebody who sold office equipment. And, you know, um, and he talked about how, you know, his big uh, selling point late, well, was uh, for new office equipment <clears throat> was um, the it lowered the cost of, uh, of electricity because they much more uh, economical, right, to run it. As opposed to, he would still talk about, oh, it's greener and all that. But what was interesting, like you found out, people would say, oh, it's important to me to have a green office. But it was more important to me to have an office that showed a profit, right? And if you could show me how replacing my uh, copier will actually increase my bottom line and as a bonus, it's green. Then he could then he could do it right and he told me that every once in a while he would get someone that yes totally green was the way to go so if you look at it that way if i know what the pain is then we can it's easier to do it right because then it's easy to link the need of the product to your service right um and what i want to do is uh, is teach you real quick again i apologize for the uh, <clears throat> red tie i called the bill clinton technique uh, I think I taught it at the, at the live training, but I want to remind you because how powerful it is. And what this is, is when you're talking to somebody and you got rapport, once you have some basic rapport, right, then you elicit the state and the person that you want in your target, right, which is usually just even if it's just being comfortable, right. And once you get that person in that state, you want to anchor it to your product using motion or energy. Now, if you to do the traditional Bill Clinton, which is you're going to elicit the state and the person that you're talking to, and you're going to elicit to, it to yourself, which is always wonderful in sales because you're the you're you're the go go to between the customer and whatever that product is. If you're the salesperson, you're buying a car. I'm the salesperson. You know, I become the extension of the car or the office equipment or the the, the hypnosis uh, results that I want. You know, that's what it is. You want to link it to you first because you're always selling yourself first and your product second. You know, if I don't trust you as a salesperson, I'll never buy your product, right? Even if I love the product, I'll probably go buy it from someone else, right? So first and for foremost, always link it to yourself. Then you can link it to your, your target, right? So you elicit the state that you want in the person, right? And then you anchor that to yourself. So you're talking to a person, so, so what's important to you about this uh, um, that you want? And they say, oh, it's, it, it, it's, it's going to make me comfortable. It's going to make me feel better. I'm going to have more energy. Well, I can appreciate that. You know, being comfortable, having energy, and, you know, being more of the person I w you want to be is, I, I can appreciate that. And you link that to yourself, right? And this is the motion that you want to get comfortable with, this little thing. Or if I had a tie on, I could touch my tie got a necklace, I can adjust my necklace. You can always just, I can appreciate that. 
and then you can just keep talking, right? It brings it to you. This is the Bill Clinton because he was notorious to, to, to elicit things to himself. And one of the speeches he gave, he was talking about how America's booming, you know, and it was in the late 90s. But every time he said something good, like, you know, we have, you know, low unemployment, there's peace, there's prosperity, there's good things happening in America. Anything good, he was anchoring to himself. You know, anything bad, he put over there, right? And so if you take the advanced Bill Clinton, which is this, would anchor good things to you, and you would anchor bad things to whatever your uh, competition is. You know, you know. I understand that you really want a competent hypnotist, somebody that you can really have, that will really help you get to your goals efficiently and the most economically, and you know, just be the kind of person you really want to work with. And you know, I, 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 I can appreciate that. Now, there's a lot of hypnotists out there that you, you know that they can, they can do okay, but will they really fulfill your need, right? Now, while you're doing this, two things have to happen. First, you have to visualize in your mind that you're really connecting with that person. And the real trick, the real bonus to this is, if in your mind when you're meeting a prospect or, or a new client, before you sit down to talk to the person, you think of somebody you, you yourself are really comfortable with. Right? Somebody that you have no trouble just being comfortable yourself and you're open. And you, and you imagine that person in front of you. Right, and basically you overlay that person on the person that you're talking to. Right, so if you do this and you start doing this, it's much more natural. The other thing that it does, without sounding too woo woo ish, is it opens up your energy. Because if I'm thinking about like Todd or Elsa Melder, somebody I get along well with, I'm my energy's open. It's easy. I'm 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 able to talk. You know, I don't mind stuttering. I don't mind doing these things. It makes the other person feel comfortable. Right, and if you do that, then all of a sudden the whole visualizing that person in your mind is easy and then visualize this, the result that you want, this person being in rapport with you and buying your product, whatever it happens to be, is very, very easy. You know, and this really goes back to the five-step sales process. Establish rapport, ask correct questions, find the need, the true need as long as, and the wants with the value right? Because then you link that need and value and what they want to your product or service. And then you can go for the close. And when you do this elegantly, there is no close. They've already bought it in their mind. It's just like, when would you like to start, right? Or cash or credit, whatever you're doing. This, that's it, basically it, right? Because also, I know the current research uh, really points out that when you try to get into fancy closing techniques and all that, People are offended, right? Um, because the internet's changed everything. People can find information. I was talking to a guy um, who's been a car salesman his whole adult life, and he's in his 50s, quite successful at it. And he sold low end, high end, uh, you know, he's just, he likes selling cars. But he was talking about how much the internet has changed his business, right? Because people come in and they know, like, hey, within a couple grand, this is what this car's worth. This is what you're going to sell it to me for. Or, this is my trade-in. This is, you know, it's like he goes to him. He's he's uh, he's starting to sell, I think, real estate more now. He always had real estate on the side because it it's taken the fun out of the car sales, as he said, right? And he goes, uh, and people are so, you know, the old programs that, that they used to do in car sales don't work anymore because it's a more informed consumer, right? And but he goes, this part, we were talking about this, this stuff still really works. If, if he knows what you value in a car, you know, he can, um, he can, he can, he can much more likely close it. In fact, he was closing, <clears throat> he worked at a Kia dealer last. And he was really closing a lot of people that, believe it or not, were much more likely to go buy a, uh, uh, the small Lexus um, SUV or the BMW, right? Because it was all about the value and the need of, of reliability. He goes, if they valued the reliability and the need over, um, um, you know, the status of driving a Lexus or a BMW, he could close like, what did he say, like seven, seven out of 10. Now, if they just wanted to pay the difference, he didn't care, you know, he wasn't gonna close them anyway, right? So it's just, you know, and, and, and it just shows the power of this, right? And I wanna close with the fact that, again, all sales are personal, right? Especially 
even if you even if it's mostly online sales you're finding out the feeling of being personal that's why I'm trying to add the video even to my webinars and things right because most people mentally buy before they buy physically right but it's about the it's about the connection that you make with the person you know am I like you are you like me can I relate to you right because we buy from people we like end of story and again if you have rapport then it's much more like that because again really all people prefer others resembling them we are like people who are like us you know and all things being equal usually buy and usually pay a lot more if it's someone you like or trust you know or they're like you right and the secret is to be one step above your client in terms of prestige right so if you're selling uh, and this is where uh, I just did a thing for some hypnotists and we're talking about one of the problems they were having trouble with selling their services is they were they wanted to be in rapport which I understood but they put themselves at a totally equal level with their client rather than be one or two steps ahead still still accessible not up here not like that but like right here and because when you're at this level you're too much of a peer you want to be one or two levels above so depending on what it is you might want to dress a little better you uh, uh, you know it's it's just this is what the current research says uh, is people drawn to you because if I'm unlike you but you're a little bit higher than me I'm gonna be more drawn to what you want right or what I want which is what you have so you want to be one step ahead right and, and this also comes in the in the area of knowledge and information right and again the the internet's changed because people come in with some information whatever that you're selling so that's just the quick review um, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining me on the call and I'm gonna post this and then uh, if you have questions you can email me at dr. will Horton uh, at gmail.com and I'll get back with the questions and we're going to do a conference call probably in a week or two uh, and it may be in another webinar format but if I have specific questions we'll put them up we'll blast those out and we'll do that so again it's uh, it's always fun to be a part of this and share with you this information so I'd like to thank you for being on the call and have a great